Hi, everyone. This is Craig Zelzer from PCDN back with this week's episode of the Social Change Career Podcast. We're actually in season 12, episode 15. I think I've got it right. Um, we're going to be talking about a really important topic, building a rewarding career and youth career development, or that's a youth workforce development. For people who have not joined us previously for the podcast, this generally goes about an hour. We stream it live to LinkedIn and YouTube. We really enjoy hearing from anyone who's watching or engaging. So throughout the podcast, particularly in the LinkedIn comments, please share a few bullet points about your work, where you're watching from, and then throughout the entire session, please put your questions and comments. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, if you like the podcast, please consider rating and sharing it. We have done over 140 other episodes with brilliant innovators from all parts of the world. I think 30 countries, ranging from impact investing to humanitarian relief to heads of foundations to heads of you know INGOs to act grassroots activists. So we really define broadly impact careers. And again, don't just focus on the global north. And then three quick requests. Again, check out PCDN and the podcast, everything else we do. Consider following Evelyn Van Til, Van Til, our guest today on LinkedIn, and also check out American Student Assistance. So that's the quick introduction. And um, Evelyn, just getting her bio here, is a strategic partnership manager at American Student Assistance. And she's a passion advocate for scaling pathways for all, driven by a mission to ignite imagination in a service of equity. I, lo I love that phrase. We'll have to come back to it. With expertise in early career, emerging talent, and K-20 through experiential learning, she's worked on various initiatives, including apprenticeships, internships, adventure, travel, service, project, play, game, and work-based learning. In, her, in addition to her work at American Student Assistance, which we'll explore what the organization does, she's organized events like Maker Hour of Code, Maker X, and other events for Computer Science Education Week. She also founded Fourth Street Farms and Urban Farm and a mission to eat, educate, empower, and employ people and join neighbors in creating the Wineland Compu Park Community Civic Association in Columbus, Ohio. Um, actually, I have relatives in Columbus. I'm based in Medellin, Colombia. And Evelyn, I assume you're in the Columbia area today? I am. I'm based in Columbus, okay. Ohio. Grew up outside of Chicago. Came here to go to Ohio State and uh, okay. never left. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. So thank you so much for making time to share your rich wisdom and experience with us. And just to start off with, um, how do you, I mean, when you think about your career, do you define, let's say, your focus on youth career and economic opportunity, or is it broader? When someone comes to you and says, what do you do? Not just specific to your current job, but in general, and it could be lots of things. How do you define sure. your professional pathway? Great question, and it's a bit of a journey, but <laughs> I can say I started in higher education, uh, spent a number of years in a variety of roles across higher education, first working on first year programs, working, standing up pilot projects, uh, trying to impact retention and um, graduation rates, um, other student success role uh, metrics, got into enrollment management and program management and career services. And through that work, got involved in workforce development. Um, and I've spent the next number of years working around micro credentials, entrepreneurialism, running a tech boot camp for a couple of years. And then um, through that work, got involved in standing up tech apprenticeship programs uh, through the Washington Technology Industry Association and our Workforce Institute of Prenti, uh, where I was uh, helping Fortune 500 companies um, stand up apprenticeship uh, programs across the nation. And through that work, working with both higher ed and adult workforce, in which we need far more work, far more effort, I've continued to, to reflect upon the need to connect the dots between higher education and workforce and K-12. Um, I did a brief stint at the Department of Education in Ohio, um, birth to eight, and saw the importance of foundational learning, formative education, and the impact that, um, you know, kids are forming their identities early on. And so those impacts really resonate. Um, if we set a foundation right, um, it's a foundation, uh, the analogy of a house, you know, build it right. <laughs> and it's true. Um, you can, you know, always come back in and remodel kitchens and um, acquire new technical skills or otherwise. Uh, but those human skills, those foundational skills are critical. So that led me to ASA, where we're changing the way Gen Z is learning about career readiness. 
um, focused currently on 13 to 18 year olds. Uh, amazing. Um, and, and just, we have, you know, in Medellin where we live, we have a friend where they're renting the house and the house is fine, but they're doing construction next to their house and it's destroying the foundation. Oh. So it's not just, you know, it's also thinking about the foundation of learning, but also all the opportunities are going to affect that and the unforeseen things. And obviously a lot is changing in the nature of learning. So before we get into more of your career, we had chatted, I think about a year or a year and a half ago, and again, the power of LinkedIn. So mm -hmm. a good example. American Student Assistance, what is it? You know, where's the organization come from? And whether someone's based in the US or not, like what type of programs or services do you all offer? Great question. So American Student Assistance or ASA is a 60 year old nonprofit headquartered in Boston. And we began this uh, journey as a loan guarantor. Um, we thought that at the time, the best efforts we had were to help people afford college education. And about 12 years ago, the board began to recognize that that uh, college wasn't performing with equity the way we thought it was. And we began to divest ourselves of the financial aid industry. And about 10 years ago, we really set the course on impacting Gen Z um, and ASA.org contains more of the information around our efforts, philanthropic, impact investing, direct to kid, um, all of which unites around research-based learning, centering the kid in education. Kids are the most important people in our world and they are the future, they are the now. And um, our efforts began to really think about how could we help kids set the course of their future with intentionality, open up pathways, build skills, and do so much earlier. We found that so many people had gone off to college or been told to go to college, not necessarily succeeding. Uh, many people don't finish college and don't get the full value of that degree. That's a piece that we need to work on together with our friends in higher education is helping with micro-credentials and other ladders or lattices, if you prefer, um, of learning um, that are flexible with clear on and off ramps that help people um, design and develop their educational goals, their ability to advance themselves lifelong. Um, really, it's critical um, for kids early on to get transparency. And for us as... Um, adults to acknowledge that it's not a linear journey. It's not likely that we've succeeded in a visionary moment of knowing exactly what we want. It's a mythical age and going forward to attain it, um, which is the narrative that sometimes comes back as you reflect on how you got to someone, somewhere. Um, it may be easier to tell a story that goes that way. Um, and I fully acknowledge that um, career readiness and career journeys are cyclical, they're iterative, they're designed, hopefully intentionally. Um, and that as we all experience a job market or a workforce space that is increasingly changing or volatile or um, evolving, that we too are set on a course to evolve. So, so thinking about your, let's say, teenage or earlier years, um, did you have particular aptitude or skills or passion thinking you might work in a particular sector or area or issue or, and how, how in the world did you discover, you know, obviously your path has changed some, but it's been consistent around supporting students in a wide range of areas around upskilling and careers. So did you, did you have a great mentor? or mentors, or you read a book, or you just fell your way into this? It's a great question. And I will start by saying, you know, I really began to work very early in life, uh, much earlier than we see kids working perhaps now. Um, and um, my first memories of her helping my mom is an Avon lady um, and, you know, being her sales assistant. Um, and helping my grandfather with his landscaping company, um, getting tools, running back and forth, digging out evergreens, those sorts of things. 
Um, I remember on my 14th birthday, my mom took me to McDonald's and said, you're getting a job. <laughs> and uh, I interviewed and, and I landed in grill. Um, I worked my way um, to drive through and um, training and opening restaurants. And over the four years that I spent there, um, I was offered a management role. I declined that offer. And three weeks later, I started at Illinois State University. Um, I wonder, uh, reflecting back, what my life would have been if I had gone the, the corporate McDonald's route. and. Um, I often also credit McDonald's. I learned so many formative skills, time to lean, time to clean, um, all kinds of customer service and suggestive selling techniques and other pieces that have led me to where I am right now. At the time, I thought I was going off to college to become a, uh, to get a PhD. Um, I, my plan was tenure track by 30. Um, and, um, was really interested in research and teaching and, um, landed at Illinois State University, which is a noted teaching college, had some great mentors and fully credit them with not only helping me make it through, um, the university, which can sometimes be a, a especially in a larger institution, a state institution with 24,000 students, certainly not as large as Ohio State where I landed after that, but, uh, Still, um, much bigger than the private school I had gone to <laughs> and uh, a much larger world, uh, one that was um, amazing and in some ways intimidating and overwhelming. Having caring faculty that reached out and helped me get, you know, move through that process, helped connect me to financial aid, helped solve uh, cur curriculum issues or how do I, where do I, all of those types of questions. Um, they guided me to graduate school. And in graduate school, I began to recognize that it wasn't the best fit for me. And while I loved teaching and researching, I recognized that um, the conditions of higher education, it's likely that I would have wound up ABD, wandering from university to university as an adjunct faculty member, trying to cobble together a life um, while finishing my, my dissertation. And I recognized I didn't want that. Um, and that the, my motivations for going to graduate school may not have been entirely pure. Maybe, I don't know if that's the right word, but, uh, I began to recognize that it was motivated by a desire to be good enough, to prove that I could be good enough and smart enough and get that doctorate, be Dr. Van Til, like my dad. And that may not be enough to, <laughs> to really healthily get through graduate school. So I took my master's as a terminal and went into marketing. And in that role, in that space, um, I worked in consulting companies. I worked for office solution organization companies. Um, I began to hone storytelling and began to recognize um, the connections between my background in English and classical studies, which I, is what I had majored in and went to graduate school for folklore and film studies. And then really the mythology that you see in marketing, the stories that you see in advertising, reflecting back the cultural values, the cultural myths, the cultural fabric that we live in, um, and ended up as a staff member back at Ohio State leading pilot programs around first year enrollment. Full circle. Um, I, I almost didn't finish my PhD. And I think a lot of people, I remember when I was, I did, I did our paths are somewhat similar. So I started working young, I mean, just more for pocket money. So, you know, mowing the lawn, raking leaves, dig, digging holes in a Christmas tree farm, working at Burger King, you know, I mean, a lot of those things. Um, and I remember when I was, in, and I went to UMass Amherst, a big state school, and it really changed my life because I had great mentors. But it was hard the first semester to figure out, you know, it's 30,000, 35,000 students to figure out where one fits. Um, and I had a really good mentor, I mean, both the director of my program that I eventually got, but the director of international study, um, international 
whatever study abroad, like she's like applied for a Fulbright, like those mentors. Yeah. Like, so, and I, I had the best class I've ever taken. I had a class because I did a radical hippie major. We spent a lot of time protesting and taking over buildings. And we had a class taught by a career counselor on how to like build a career of impact and not take a vow of poverty. And as one, of, and she did it as a, you know, I think she got paid some, but that was, she liked working with idealistic students mm -hmm. who were trying to impact the world in positive ways. And that, I mean, lots of things have affected me, but that's one of those things that is guided and, and that finding the right mentors and, and obviously I've been a professor for a long time. It's so important. And ju I just put a little post here when I, when I was at UMass, I remember I was talking to someone who was teaching, it was finishing their PhD. And she said, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I remember in my mind, I'm like, no, it, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard. And then once I started, oh my gosh. I mean, for some people it's not, for me, it was very hard. And I almost dropped out many times. So I, I wrote a post that people can find on Medium or PCN about the PhD or not the PhD, both looking at the challenges, but also the finances. Yeah. And when, whenever someone asks me about doing a PhD, my, it's almost like the test. I'm like, do you really want to do this? Do you like, you know, it's almost like two or three times and I ask them to really understand the market, mm -hmm. their motivations. And and then, you know, if, if by the third time, like, yes, then I'll try to support them a lot. But it's, it, it's a weird process. It, has, it hasn't changed and adapted to the nature of the job force. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, so, so to get at some specific things, um, and I, I also worked at university tour guide, admissions, advising. So, you know, all, all those things, it's really. So yeah, yeah, about, I can see a lot of crossover there, you, for sure. I mean, I mean, so let's first talk about kind of higher education. And a lot of people, I mean, universities or community colleges or, you know, whatever size institution, there are a lot of really interesting jobs on college campuses. And if people are interested in social impact, there are conflict resolution positions or like student judicial affairs, there's student clubs, there's organizing, there's study abroad, there's service learning. So just can you just talk a little bit about for people, I'd say the average age of people listening to the podcast is 32, but we have mm -hmm. you know younger and older. So for people who are thinking about, they want to do impact in the world, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about working at universities, the pros and cons, and which sectors or areas or roles might you encourage people to look at? Yeah, that's a great stack of questions there. Um, finding your purpose is incredibly important. And I think that's really the center, right? Finding not only, some people call it your ikigai, or um, your raison d'etre, um, your reason for being, um, and finding that appropriate mix of the things that you like to do, the things that you can do, which aren't always the same things that uh, you like to do, right? The things that you can do. Like I can wash dishes. I can wait tables. I'm a great waitress. It doesn't fulfill me at this point, but I did learn great things doing it. And then those buckets of what you can get paid for um, and looking at for yourself the values that you hold, the people that you wish to be around the types of purpose um, that you're looking to affect at that moment, which can change or um, fluctuate through your life. So sometimes I've taken roles that have been more purpose and less pay. Sometimes I've taken roles that are, uh, you know, equivalently purpose and pay. And other times there may be roles that you take for other reasons they give you flexibility or they meet a need for your desire to grow or to be able to expand your network or meet a desire to fulfill your, or, um, you know, work on your portfolio or, um, it, it, it's, it may meet another need for you. Um, keeping track of those needs, those values, those things that fulfill you, those, um, environmental conditions, um, I think is a really critical piece of driving your own career. So whether you are an entrepreneur in the sense that you have your own company or you're adopting entrepreneurial mindset, you might be in a university environment equipped with that entrepreneurial mindset and a sense of purpose. You are then able to seek out grants or find a way to um, network within your um, uh, current university or across higher ed, 
or within the larger ed tech space, which is doing some really exciting things. Um, and as higher ed is um, evolving or going through um, changes, um, which may include or have included, you know, fluctuating enrollment and um, many of the challenging environments, including COVID or deploying during difficult situations, um, that larger environment of ed tech has been iterating and growing and transforming some of it within higher ed, some of it driven by higher ed, and much of it outside of the space of higher ed in the space of credentialed learning or other pathways that people have taken in the past and are getting more transparency or visibility around. Um, and whether that's apprenticeship, whether that's work-based learning, whether that's service learning, some of that could be inclusive of higher ed and some of it may um, be operating well outside of traditional higher educational spaces and include things like boot camps or other programs that issue micro credentials. And then for people who may not have heard the term ed tech, I mean, it's, it's really a huge mm -hmm. growth area. My, Kathleen and my wife and I do small scale angel investing. So we've invested like small amounts in a couple of really interesting ed tech organizations and companies that are trying to run pathways to lifelong learning for all different kinds of populations. Um, so what exactly is ed tech? You know, and they're, they're in the tech world, there often is an assumption, which I think is not correct, that tech's going to solve all the problems. And, like, and especially in the age of AI, like and we, and we, I teach a course on Maven, which is a great ed tech platform, a couple of courses, but one is on AI for impact. And so how do you define ed tech and do you need to speak human and geek? Do you need to be a coder? Or like what? And what are the most exciting areas for you in ed tech? That's a great set of questions, and I'll try to do it justice. Um, for anyone not familiar with ed tech, I invite you to Google ASU GSV. It's going on right now, uh, live streaming and in person at San Diego. I think you're going to get a window into uh, the a level of innovation, birth to earth across both what I would call ed tech and inclusive of things called HR tech or career tech, um, which may um, provide even a finer line of um, tools or solutions related to the topic of conversation today. Um, I wait towards the human always. Uh, humans, these are tools, these are platforms and no tool, even as powerful as AI, um, should ever really replace, well, how, let me phrase it this way. There are uniquely human skills, skills that are so preciously human that they should not be done by uh, deployed through algorithm. Uh, skills like discernment, uh, and other skills that are uniquely human are really critical to ensure that tools are deployed with equity and that we're not replicating barriers, baking them into uh, technology that could be used to liberate us from um, a number of um, low skill or um, irritating or repetitive tasks that most humans would like to, to eschew, like setting calendar appointments or other things that help us uh, navigate our world a bit better. Um, tools, I think, broadly about from pencils forward. If a human created it, it's technology and it should serve humans. The technology should always be um, mindful or deployed with guardrails or um, principles in place that ensure that humans are the most important piece of anything that we're doing. People are, are the most precious and irreplaceable. Technology itself um, is tremendous and 
is assistive in lots of components. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity as we move forward with technology to continue to lean into the ways in which it can be assistive, the ways that it can open doors and um, connect the world. I'm calling in from Columbus, Ohio, right? And I'm able to chat with you and around the world with people that we couldn't have afforded, we couldn't have gotten together in, in, in one place. And while it would be lovely in many ways to do so, it also helps open our world to be able to connect with people on a day-to-day -day basis in a, in a totally um, accessible way. Um, so j just one quick story. So it's interesting. I was just thinking, I, I went to Thailand a bunch of times for work to teach in a rotary program, the Rotary Peace Fellowship, so people should check it out. And I remember, and I've co-taught with my wife, Catalina, and I remember one time we were traveling around Thailand and we would go from intern, we had our Lonely Planet guidebook. Um, and I don't, I don't speak Thai, I speak a couple languages. And we go from internet cafe to internet. Like we go to one place, you know, figure out what we're going to do, hang out for a while, and then go to internet cafe to figure out where we're going to go next. And we're going to Argentina. I mean, I live in Colombia where we're going to go for my 50th but because of COVID, we never made it. So we're going and I planned the trip. I mean, I knew in January we were going to go, but literally we were coming back from visiting my parents and using, I think I used Claude, a couple of different AI tools within 10 minutes. I, I didn't plan out all the details, but I was like, this is what we're looking for. And obviously I'd done some research, but like planned almost everything out in 10 minutes. You know, not, not the day-to-day -day stuff, but look, okay, these are the places we're going to go in general. And then who knows? So it's just, it's amazing to me how rapidly AI... And even this, I remember when I first studied abroad in Hungary in the early 90s, like a long distance, I wrote postcards and letters. Right. A long distance phone call was so expensive, like 20 or $30. Prohibitively, right? Yes. Yeah, so I remember arguing yeah. with my roommates, who who spent this on that? Who spent 27 <laughs> seconds talking to someone? Yeah. Right? yeah. It's, oh, yeah. my gosh. Um, so, so, so one of the things, if uh, there's a lot of talk... I mean, there's a lot of underemployment in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of bad jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and the nature of employment and upskilling is changing so quickly now. It so is. I think, let's say when I was in high school in the late 80s, you know, you would, the idea was you would hopefully finish high school. Some people would go to college, some would go to trade school, you know, some might join the military or all different things. But generally, like you, the idea is you might have a career path and, if, you know, and I think now it's like it's portfolio career there is, you know, unless you're going to be like a doctor or civil servant, there generally is not just a career path. They're going to have multiple jobs and multiple career. Like, let's say mm -hmm. you know, the futurist from the UK, I'm going blank on his name, but as I've heard him speak, I think estimate we're going to have 12 to 20 jobs over the course of our lifetime and probably three to four careers. So what in the world, if you're thinking about helping youth you know, young people, 13 to 18, my son's just turned 13. Oh, you know, so happy if you think birthday. About, thank you. If you think about what, what does it mean to provide, I mean, there's two questions here. One, what does it mean to be an adult kind of working in that space? And two is like, what are the most useful evidence-based things that either educators, parents, community leaders can do to help youth figure out at least the, the, initial steps to their portfolio career? Great set of questions. Um, I'm going to start with saying, I think as an adult who is on our, her 37th job and I have, um, to interrupt, I have to interrupt really 37 jobs, 37 different jobs. Okay. Um, okay. And I am counting things before uh, I turned 16 or 18. Okay. Um, I'm counting those things like assisting my mom as an Avon lady or okay. my paper route that I may not okay. have mentioned or other things that I learned I would consider as part of career readiness or okay. um, they acquainted me with a job. I had a role. In many cases, I was getting paid. Um, it may not be much. Uh, uh, $5, I think, was uh, the standard fee for for mowing lawns or um, I think I made 385 an hour at McDonald's when I started um, and formative experiences, critical pieces. 
Did I have a sense at that time that I would land as a strategic partnership manager at American Student Assistance? Absolutely not. I spent many years in program roles. Um, and uh, me, I mean, I led, led programs or I um, designed programs or I stood up programs or I was a teacher for a program. And it wasn't until more recently that I reflected upon all of the things that I really enjoyed about programs and the things that I wanted to, to learn in, in going forward um, that I realized I could turn around and externally facing, go after partnerships, which has been fulfilling for me. I share that because it's an iterative journey. I didn't know where I was going. And I think that level of transparency is helpful when we're thinking about talking with those younger than us, that I didn't have it all figured out. I wasn't, you know, mythically anointed with any kind of knowledge at age eight that I was on a destiny to do a thing. I have been trying to figure it out myself and sharing those tools back, those really cutting edge tools back with um, both ed tech uh, leaders in ed tech and in the work that we're doing direct to kid um, to surface for kids the best of what's out there to figure things out and to learn from kids. So part of what I do now is applied research, where we have a tool called Evolve Me that goes direct to kid. Um, and this tool or platform is a collection of um, over 50 partners, contributions, over 120 different activities that kids can take um can choose on their own volition what they want to do in whatever order, earn points, get gift cards or scholarship opportunities for those points. And we can learn from the kids what they need in terms of learning. When we're looking at the data, reflecting at schools, there's a lot of challenges washing up in our, our schools today. And I'm, I know that everyone who works in education is really trying their very best, um, or I want to believe that we're all trying our very best to do right by our kids. And I know that there are constraints and kids are spending seven to nine hours of their time outside of school on their phones or other devices, trying to explore their world and figure out what adults aren't telling them. And so <laughs> as one of the better actors in the space, um, we would be remiss if we didn't meet kids where they are trying to figure things out and surface to them really good experiences, service learning opportunities, mentorship opportunities, mock interview or informational interview opportunities, ways to create resumes or build skills or explore pathways that may be not transparent to you. Some kids know they have lots of options. Many kids don't. Most kids can only name a handful of job titles and they really don't know what those jobs do. They're relying on cues from social media, from movies or from what little adults tell them about what we do to really try to understand. And we're putting decisions in front of kids in really early times that impact them in ways that they may not know. So for example, as a kid, if I um, am asked what classes I want to take, I may not know that deciding not to take math or to take a lesser science or um, to spend more time doing this or dropping out of certain things, not doing clubs or activities, I may not know that that's really closing doors to my future. I might be a kid who's been diagnosed with a disability which is true for about 42% of Gen Z. And many times that might start to strip out math or science or some of those opportunities well before kids have formed any sense of where they're going or what they're doing. I used to run kids code camps for um, ages nine to 12. And unless I was really, really loud and clear 
that this was an experience, a free experience offered at a library or a school for girls and boys and anyone else who wants to join. I would walk into a classroom and it was a lot less diverse than I believed the school might be. Um, and when asking, it was clear that the adults had made decisions to send the girls or other students elsewhere. And they're nine. They're interested in everything. And they need an opportunity. They need a chance, a choice, possibly more than once. To have technology or other tools or uh, challenges surface to them in ways that meet them where they are and connect them with opportunities that they can explore, try, fail, try again. And game-based learning, service learning, these are great opportunities for people to try and test things out in safe ways. And we believe at ASA that middle school is a particularly ideal time to surface career readiness to kids. Kids are certainly forming their identities earlier than middle school. And it's really important that we not close doors um, at those ages either. And certainly middle school, fifth to eighth grade or seventh to eighth grade, depending on how middle school or junior high may be deployed in a particular school district. These are formative times where kids are creating their identities. They're starting to take uh, developmental steps, um, not yet adults, but beginning to have really clear preferences for um, particular affinities, um, listening and watching for those affinities. The kids that like to doodle, the kids that like to do things or that are movers or shakers, those kids who are playing games or who are inventive or creative, there's something there. Um, and I understand that as adults, sometimes kids may act in ways that we wish they wouldn't. Maybe they get frustrated or bored or they, they wish that they were being engaged in different ways. And that's understandable both sides. At the same time, those cues of what kids innately want to do are often guiders or elements that may, as adults, be those pieces, those threads that we want to help kids find the appropriate place to uh, try that out. Uh, there may be a career, uh, something innately in that kid is pushing them to go in a direction and that journey might be worth taking. Um, so lo lots of deep content for thought and just one example from Columbia and my son, you know, so he's, he's a pretty good student, you know, he, he's struggling right now. We switched schools maybe nine months ago and they have music. So he's like struggling with violin. They, like he's got to do a lot of extra work. And actually, um, you know, he's good at math and he's really an athlete, um, and, but he's, he's got lots of things. But it's interesting because in Colombia, like his team just won recently like a league championship and, you know, like football is his life, uh, soccer. Um, and in Colombia, there is very good girls and women's football, but it's very underfunded and under, particularly, you know, they're, it, it's getting better, just like U.S. women's football. But it's like a lot of, at a certain point, we have friends who have girls who play soccer or football, but then they get, they get to about 10 or 11, they don't see even if they're passionate, they, a lot of them don't see the opportunity. So they switch to more, you know, things that are supposedly appropriate for girls. But it, but it is changing because the Colombian women's national team did really well in the World Cup. And But it's just interesting, like, what is defined as culturally appropriate and what's supported in schools. And so, so a question here is how, when you think about your work at American Student Assistance or just work with educators, the nature and the type of jobs are changing so fast that how do you help educators or directly with students them develop the skills and curiosity to be i mean everybody unless we have universal basic income where people come from wealthy backgrounds everybody needs to make money to survive and hopefully save so how do you, how do you find the balance of like curiosity experimentation helping them start to understand career paths when they're changing so fast and you know any thoughts because 
you yeah. know, a lot of the research shows that jobs that are going to exist now for kids in first or second grade in 10 or 15 years are going to be so much different than what we think. Absolutely. And it's changing at a very rapid pace. And I definitely saw this uh, even when I was running a boot camp um, a number of years back. I would have people attending some of our meetups or other events who had gone to college and were here exploring boot camps because the thing that they had gone to college thinking they were going to do no longer existed. And I was really intrigued also by the number of people showing up to those kinds of events who were lawyers, who were doctors, who were in these fields that accountants, who were, um, at least in my childhood and lifetime, um, been told these are really secure occupations. These are places where, you know, professionally your identity, you go, you decide, you become an accountant and there you are um, and lawyer and so forth. And yet these folks were turning up at boot camp events, exploring opportunities to learn new skills because they saw in their own careers and in their own lived realities that accounting was changing. TurboTax had shifted everything. Um, you know, uh, the easy billable hours for legal, ta- you know, um, what is it? Zoom, uh, legal Zoom um, and other platforms that had made filing your own taxes, filing your own will, uh, other easy, low-hanging, create your own business. Um, All of these sorts of things had turned into apps um, and that it was harder and harder to kind of carve out some of those easier billable hours. And it's not saying that we won't still need people who have some expertise in these areas, Um, but you're right. The world is shifting, it's changing. And what I would point to first, of course, is your own purpose and being true to who you are, which changes, hopefully, through through life um, that you might grow. And that is a good thing that you might have the opportunity to not do just one thing in your life, but the opportunity to grow your skills, which are many, to leverage your strengths which are critically important to who you are and getting things done to know that you have strengths and to follow those things as a compass towards whatever it is that pulls you. We don't yet know, and we may not know crystal balls still on an outstanding order here. (laughs) Um, (laughs) We'd love to have one. Um, And what I can say is, it is true now, as it is likely in the future, that our human skills, our uniquely human skills, um, or what sometimes are called durable skills, or um, uh, may have other names, soft skills, other, other um, people refer to them in different ways. Those skills that are uniquely human are those skills least likely to be automatable, and or um, executable or replaceable. Additionally, there's key infrastructure that has to be here, right? There's certain pieces that um, I think we have an opportunity to, um, in a new collar kind of way, break down divides that have previously existed between white and blue collar. In a new collar space, micro-credentials and Um, IOT, smart buildings, no society is a society, a functioning society, if we can't flush a toilet, if we can't heat our buildings, if we can't take care of our own infrastructure. And those things are here. So while expertise and thought, not, you know, knowledge workers and technology can be deployed in any space and help us bridge the divides between local and global, It's also true that many occupations may continue to be uh, necessarily both human, skilled, and um, critically deployed in local spaces. Um, So it's really interesting to think about, and I'm really bad, I mean, like, at fixing things in the house. I, I'm, I'm good at like, you know, pretty good at computers. I can do a little gardening, but when it comes to holes in the wall, like that's just not my skill set. So I know when we need to call somebody. 
So I want to ask a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So um, some people would say the idea of having purpose in your work is privileged. And mm. there's billions of people in the world who are underemployed or eking out a living day to day. Mm -hmm. And that the idea of purpose is, you know, only available to a certain economic class of people. And that the idea of trying to educate youth and others to find their purpose, it's, I won't say ridiculous, but it, it's, it's, it's like, a, you know, the pie in the sky. And that mm. maybe it's just good enough to say, find something to pay the bills. And then like live your life outside of that. And the U.S. tends mm -hmm. to be more workaholic than a lot of countries, not all. Um, and there's a book I haven't read yet um, called The Good Enough Job by Simon Stolzov. Mm -hmm. That's on my list to read. And, you know, that, that's part of his thing is let's get away from the worship of work yeah. or whatever term you want to use. And I'm just when you're thinking yeah. about career development for youth, how do you find that balance of saying like we're in a society, most societies, people need to earn to pay their bills and is is it good to talk about purpose or is it just like find something to, like th that kind of balance of like, yes, work. I mean, I, I, I find my work very fulfilling and I wish everybody has that opportunity, but just any thoughts on that kind of dichotomy or paradox? I don't think it's a paradox, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, the importance of purpose is that you are a whole person, which as you point out, in our society requires that you work. And the degree to which your ikigai or that Venn diagram may weight towards the things for which I could get paid versus the things that I like to do or the things that I can do, that may change through your life, right? I've recounted many jobs, uh, possibly, you know, um, ones that I didn't mention in waiting tables or scrubbing floors or other, you know, landscaping. I found purpose in those things at the time. Sometimes that purpose was monetary. Sometimes that purpose was spending time with my grandfather or other people that were important to me. Sometimes that purpose weights very much towards, as you indicated, doing the thing that allows me enough provision that I get to do the things that I like. And it's not that there's a hierarchy there. There's a Venn diagram there. And if you are the per if you are the person who is making a choice and making um, a decision to just frame how you think, I could think of many of those jobs as I just smell like pickles or this is a horrible thing my parents are doing to me or whatever. Or, you know, the many times it's been difficult to pay my bills. Um and I recognize that I do in all of this perhaps come at it from a place of choice and privilege and at the same time still have to pay my bills and not hopefully live in my car or elsewhere. <laughs> and it's been tough. I mentioned it's 37 jobs, not been an easy journey. What we know from data, though, from our kids is that they are looking at the opportunities available to them and they don't necessarily want a job. They want a purpose. They want to feel like they matter. Um, and finding the place that matters can look different for different people. So I don't know if it's helpful to share, but um, Currently, my husband has a job where he works in big office buildings and he mostly cleans um, these giant engines and giant um, uh, machines that power the building. And he absolutely loves it. It's exactly what he needs right now to feed his soul and have a tangible thing that he can tick a box. It's done. And he loves machines, which, you know, is a whole other thing. And it gives him the space to run his business in the mornings, which is the thing that he has a lot of passion around. Sometimes you make choices to, to take a job that pays the bills to allow you to do the thing that you really want to do. Doesn't mean that you don't find necessarily some degree of purpose or fulfillment in it. 
That could be in just connecting with your colleagues. It could be in a job well done. It could be just in the sense of the skills that you are building or the fortitude that you have in doing it. That can be a sense of strength. And sometimes for me, a sense of building my confidence or rebuilding my confidence after a particularly difficult or traumatic experience. Yes. I mean, very wise words. And it, you know, it's in Colombia, about 60% of the population lives, you know, I mean, there's a super wealthy, like I've never yeah. seen, but a lot of the population is making way below the minimum wage or not even any wage or just doing, you know, daily labor. So it's, it's, you know, it's very, so then the question, I mean, this is not for you to answer, but it's like, just there's so much inequality in the world. And obviously the world has so many challenges. It'd be great if everyone's job, no matter what it was, was connected to something to do with whether it's sustainability or education or health, like not just building widgets. Like we don't, we don't need more stuff, but that, so, so a couple of other, we still, a couple of other questions. So for anyone who's interested in the me evolve platform, do you have to be a student in the U S or for example, in my son's school in Columbia, can youth anywhere in the world register? Do they need a parent or a teacher? And you talked about, you know, it's gamified, it's interactive. So was it generally the idea, how do students find you? And then obviously not everyone will be engaged, but do some students stay engaged by the time they're 18? And then do you kind of say good luck and then <laughs> they go off on their own or like what happens? Like what's the theory of change by doing this? they're going to be more equipped and then better prepared, whatever comes next. Great set of questions. Um, and I will say Evolve Me is one of many initiatives that ASA is embarked upon. Um, ASA uh, launched evolveme.asa.org uh, um, one year ago, um, almost exactly. Um, and in the last year, we've reached a million, over a million kids. American student assistance, we are focused on the U.S. Um, from a perspective of our resources. So websites are freely available to anyone who can log, you know, who can access them online. Um, the point system and the scholarships, the gift cards attached, we do reserve the right to um, limit the eligibility as described in our terms of service for those 13 to 18 based in the US. Um, and we also are certainly aware of interest um, in Evolve Me beyond the US. Um, certainly have, have had a number of conversations beyond the, the US. Um, partners um, are providing content um, and they may not all be based in the US. Um, many of the partners may be based in Australia or in, the, in Europe or around the world. Um, and um, there are also activities outside of Evolve Me, um, which if it's helpful to mention, was built with 47 studies and 6,700 participants, ages 13 to 18, giving us feedback on what works. So from an Evolve Me perspective, it's applied research and we're hoping to learn from kids, uh, building as they provide feedback those solutions forward to help connect the dots on pathways to life after high school. And we have also resources that um, we have launched with Canva um, and our friends at AMLE, the Association for Middle Level Educators, that are worldwide and are all free. Okay, so if you are an educator, a parent, or I mean, I don't think we'll have too many youth listening at that age listening directly to this, but please share the resources. It's a really, really interesting platform. And, you know, I remember when I was in high school, I took one of those career tests, and I don't remember what, you know, this is not sitting down doing some, bu um, what do you call the bubble tests, and then it's going to tell you your aptitude. It's much more engaging. So, um, so as a strategic, we'll finish up in about five or six minutes as a strategic partnership manager, what, what in the world do you do every day? Like, are you just a relationship builder? Are you, I'm not just, that's not the, you, <laughs> I'll take the word just out, but are you like a network weaver, a relationship builder, building alliances for more content? Like, how do you define the scope of your role and, 
you know, for, and the, how would you say, maybe not for ASA, but, you know, the role you're doing, is it called this type of job title across many industries or each industry has its own kind of name for what you do? Oh, that's a great stack of questions. Um, my goodness. Well, I, I can say that it does appear that, um, you know, different companies or organizations may have strategic partnerships. Managers do di slightly different things. Sometimes it's a more narrowly defined uh, role. Sometimes it's a more broadly defined role. Um, I always love broadly defined roles. Um, <laughs> background is a liberal arts uh, major. I like to go broad. Um, and I think I see career readiness and ASA sees career readiness as a very broad issue, inclusive of those human skills, those social capital pieces, those the village that it takes to uh, raise the kid and not just a deployment of technological skills. I totally believe, and I believed uh, when I ran a boot camp that I was doing career readiness. And what I learned in doing that is that people need more than technical skills. People need to have the stories. They need to have the perspective. They need to be able to present themselves in a way that it describes their skills and it um, concisely um, explains the value that they can uh, lend to an organization in a particular role. And it's going to take more hands than we currently have um, to provide that career readiness for all people. And it really does need to be a birth to earth, uh, I think, initiative. There's only so much ASA can do. And we invite st strategic partners because we know this. So the analogy I use is stone soup. If you're familiar with the fable, the villager, um, there's a, a stranger who comes to the village that's starving. They have a solution and together they create the soup that feeds everybody. Um, the stranger only has a magic rock um, that they place in, in the water and say that it's broth. And in stirring the broth, you, you make um, people believe that it can happen. And I think um, that is the magic of partnership, that when people bring together the various resources that you, each party has on a win-win basis, you can affect great change. So at ASA, we knew that we could not, did not want to build a giant solution. That the solutions were smaller and to be found in all kinds of places. That um, many different hands make lighter the lift and have um, various slices of what's um, needed to shift the entire um, outcomes here. So if we're trying to boil an ocean, which I think we are <laughs> uh, acknowledging, uh, even on the United States level, 15 million kids is a lot of kids. Um, there's about 42 million kids in the K to 12 system. And then if you think about how quickly those kids get older and become adults and go forward into adult workforce and the amount of skilling and upskilling that's necessary even now and projecting forward what's needed. Um, we're going to need a lot more robust solutions than just one website. And what we hope to learn with Evolve Me and with the partners that we are deploying with is how to affect change in meeting kids directly where they are in a carrot-driven, incentive-driven way. So much of education is a have to or a must or using the stick to clobber people into doing a thing. Efficaciously, not the most effective way, right? We know that if people, if we can ignite an intrinsic motivation in people, if people are driven to do the right things, to do, to find their purpose, to continue to grow, and they have belief and hope, they will continue to drive their own, their own um, journeys. 
And it is a much lighter lift as a society if we can ignite people's internal intrinsic motivations and this desire in a positive direction. Too much of what we have currently is framed, don't do this, don't be that. Um, it's very negative in its in its connotations. And so if there's anything I leave here today um, sharing, it's around finding that internal purpose that is positive, that is intrinsic, that no matter where you might find yourself, no matter what you might want to do or the steps that are necessary to get to where you want to go. Um, people don't emerge in that final uh, uh, incarnated state <laughs> as a CEO or as a leader or as a whatever. There were many, 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 many steps that got people to wherever it is that they are, they want to be. And with so many people in this world and so many challenges, wouldn't it be amazing if we centered the humans and deployed those humans to successfully uh, conquer these various challenges that you've described, the lack of engagement or the inequity or all of these things I believe are completely changeable if we can change ourselves. Amazing. And, and our systems. Um, so three quick questions. Um, one for American student assistant, I mean, you're not recruiting for them, but does the organization hire infrequently or frequently? And are the jobs mostly in Boston? You know, I mean, you don't, you don't have to go over the whole thing, but just are there regular openings for people who are US based who are interested in, in these kind of opportunities? Great question. Um, ASA is a pretty small organization. I would point broadly towards ed tech and career tech and our friends in HR tech as an exploding uh, phenomenon. So if you're looking for employment, looking to find purpose, I would check out ed tech in general. I pointed towards ASU, GSV in, in specific earlier and would add our friends in uh, FOHE.org, Friends of Higher Education is another great community, um, which you might find useful in your work um, or your efforts to build community. And looking at the ASU GSV website, the Elite 50, um, those organizations, those companies that were just awarded um, prize money um, for their innovation and growth, that would be a great indicator that they may be hiring. And look at other organizational prizes like Yaz Prize, X Prize, and other champion um, or challenge um, driven um, initiatives. Catalyze is another one where organizations compete for funding, um, can compete on initiatives um, around innovation and leading the way. Those organizations that are getting funding are organizations that are going to need to scale, that will need humans to do that. Um, finding those um, places where your people, um, those who share uh, your values or your your particular purpose-driven mindset, conferences or other events can be great places to look and aggregate um, those people who are speaking, who are sponsoring. They're doing so because they want to be found. So, so just a follow-up question related to that. Um, are there, you've talked about ASU GSV Summit or GSV, um, mm -hmm. sorry about uh, Friends of Higher Education, but just for your own learning, is there any podcast, listservs, blogs, or conferences or ecosystem organizations that for people interested in youth mm -hmm. work for? I mean, what, a really good one more for people in development is um, Making Sense International, which does like the Global Youth Economic Opportunity Summit some years. And they're doing a lot on, you know, workforce and career upskilling, particularly in the global majority. But any any favorite resources, conferences, podcasts? Sure, happy to to add some. Um, so JFF Jobs for the Future, um, they have great articles, research policy pieces. Um, one of my favorites is on 
an analogy that explores how youth career development is similar to youth sports leagues in that you might need um, different levels, farm league and major league. You put hand, you put um, baseballs and uh, soccer balls in the hands of every kid. Um, not necessarily because you believe that all of them are going to become major league sports uh, players, but because they are going to learn something, teamwork, um, how to win, how to persist, all kinds of different skills can be built in sports. And that same analogy is used and carried over into career readiness. JFF has a whole lot of different articles, um, including um, recently launched articles um, exploring beyond degrees, um, which give us a great read on um, attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, and opportunities beyond degrees um, for, uh, it gives a read on educator beliefs and parental or family beliefs, um, as well as what points towards what's needed um, in terms of ongoing research. Um, America Succeeds has a great framework for durable skills, durableskills.org. Um, we've recently launched some um, tremendous work with Getting Smart. Getting Smart has a whole series on the portrait of a graduate. Um, everyone's invited to participate um, in giving feedback in the pathways work. Um, about a couple weeks ago, I think three or four weeks ago, we launched New Pathways, which will be a two-year campaign to re-describe the framework that has failed us in terms of college or career as a binary. Um, as you pointed out, almost everybody who goes to college still has to work. So that artificial binary isn't uh, helpful. How do we redefine that as pathways, a multiplicity of things that people do, some of which are credentialed, some of which are self and continuous learning. Others might be described in other ways. We certainly don't have all the answers and invite many stakeholders to participate in adding their voices to the work. Um, Amer the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has a tremendous initiative going on um, entitled EPIC, um, which brings paid internships to a variety of pilot spaces. More is needed there. Um, I could continue <laughs> to go on. I'm happy to point you towards the ASA.org website, which has a lot of different uh, resources uh, around research, data, and stakeholders in this space that are sharing out um, or uh, convening various different initiatives, um, some of which around AI and ethical deployment within education, certainly a critical place where so many voices more are needed, both from industry and from the nonprofit educational sector. Um, the pace of change there is, is a bit terrifying. Um, <laughs> and we need humans to step up, um, in that space. Um, I continue to find, um, that, uh, for myself, there's an amazing array of podcasts on LinkedIn, um, like yours, Craig, um, that some of which I know about and go find, and some of which I see colleagues of mine share and um, encourage everyone to, um, I don't know if the right word is, be greedy around knowledge, to just like be thirsty. Um, I carve out a little time every morning to look for podcasts, uh, news articles, research, other things released that day that feed my mind as I go into the rest of my day and form me on uh, just staying current so that every day I get a little microdose a little bit of knowledge, a little extra something that I just learned that day. Um, and stacking that up over time, you continue to learn, grow, and evolve. Maybe maybe you could be curating your own curation. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious because you know, that's one of the best ways of engaging on LinkedIn. If you shared, I, I, would, I mean, obviously I'm connected to you, but if you said, here's two interesting things, I mean, Heckinger reports also really good. There's a lot of good. Oh my gosh, yes. This. Holland, uh, Burning mm -hmm. Glass or MC Burning mm -hmm. Glass, okay. really, you know, um, just tremendous studies. Um, so certainly um, I share out on LinkedIn um, so much that some of which ASA has a hand in, some of which I just personally find interesting. 
Um, feel free to follow me um, for mental, <laughs> many of these things if you're not familiar. Um, and yep. I'd love we'll to learn from these. you. Yeah, we'll put these in the show notes, a lot of these. So the last question, sorry, two quick questions, then we're actually going to wrap up. So are you currently working on, ups I mean, it's, you're a continuous learner, that's obvious. Are there any particular areas you're trying to learn or upskill a bit more, or it's just kind of constant in everything you do? Constant. So voracious learner, mm -hmm. um, broadly interested in all of humanity, and um very interested right now in AI. Um, certainly many other voices are much stronger than mine or ASAs on this matter. Um, we are still learning, keeping uh, pace on what's going on and um, joining others who are active in this area, who have expertise, um, many of whom are con congregated today at ASU GSV in San Diego and many more will be at um, other conventions that have been or are currently going on. Um, I think AI in education is, is right now this week. Um, there's other efforts in STEM. Um, and um, as we move forward, I'm hopeful that we will rethink STEM, which I think has served us well in many ways. And also been a limiting factor in that um, technology alone, science, mathematics, engineering, um, as boxes, they first need to be connected to each other. Um, there is no part of engineering that isn't science or mathematical or technological, uh, even the theoretical pieces, right? And what is STEM without human? What is STEM without business? What is STEM without a purpose? These things, uh, strategies that engage all minds is really the critical piece that we need. Centering users, um, technology for technology's sake cannot be the mindset. It must be putting people first, putting users first and equipping everyone on a baseline we are all users on a user journey called life <laughs> and we are designing it. And that design thinking, those design thinking principles are I think useful in career services and career readiness as they are in introducing kids and all humans to the various ways in which user design and design thinking is a part of every field out there and every role that you may have within either your own organization or an organization that you are employed by, you are having your own user experience and you're impacting any customer or student or learners that you may be serving in theirs. I think it's a useful framework for us to keep in mind as we go forward into these the wild, wild west of AI mm -hmm. to keep centered on these critical guardrails uh, around humanity. And then my last question, thank you for going a little bit extra. Is there any recent book, show, or movie that is occupying your mind in a good way? It doesn't <laughs> have to have anything to do with, you know, it doesn't have to anything to do with work stuff, but just something that you might say, recommend others to take a look at or watch. Oh my gosh, that would be another hour. But uh, I can say very quickly, I am reading Michelle Weiss's Long Life Learning, um, which is, just very illuminating. Um, the subtitle is preparing for jobs that don't even exist. Um, I think it's got a lot of um, pieces and parts that um, point to what we can do in the K-12 and higher ed space to connect the dots, to bridge the silos, and to really anchor around purpose uh, with clear on and off ramps. Um, I'm also, um, had just finished Crisis Proofing Today's Learners, uh, which our CEO, Gene Eddy, um, released earlier um, last year. The subtitle, Reimagining Career Education to Prepare Kids for Tomorrow's World. I think those two books combined, for those interested in this podcast today, they might be really illuminating pieces. Um, and beyond that, I can certainly say, um, follow the kids. 
they know where it's at. <laughs> I feel like that should be a t-shirt that maybe ASA could have, you know, if you're you know, branded, branded <laughs> I merchandise. But if I wore that, my son would be very happy. Although, although I don't, sometimes I wonder where the slang the slang, you know, the slang is different every generation, but he, there's certain words he just says every day. I'm like, where did you pick up this slang? But anyway, um, so thank you. <laughs> if the kids didn't push us, they wouldn't be doing their jobs, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's so illuminating to see yeah. and, and invigorating and wonderful to see them, you know, pushing the trends, pushing music, pushing technology. Um, it's amazing, you know, well, your son and, and so many like him. Uh, I think they're obviously they're the now and they're the future. And it's our job as adults to clear the path for them. Yep. And I think they're much more purpose driven and also much more skeptical of mm. everything that, you know, it's not what you say. It's what, you know, it's not what the institutions or politicians or parents say. It's like, what are we actually doing? But yeah. Thank you. The kids are real. Yeah. So maybe that maybe that'll be a product from ASA or on the side. <laughs> Listen to the kids. But thank thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your energy. And I hadn't heard of either of those books. And so I will definitely check them out. And so the I won't list all the organizations or we won't list them all, but a lot of the key ones we'll add in the show notes, some of the books. And in wrapping up, please check out American Student Assistance, follow Evelyn on LinkedIn. Um, please consider sharing and rating the podcast. And we're you know, getting close to the end of season 12. We still have some great episodes to go. And you can go to PCN Global and search across sectoral area and find, you know, it's, it's a, whatever your career area of interest. I mean, we haven't had people from all industries. It has something to do with impact, but you'll find it. And you also can find us on major podcasting platforms. So thank you so much, Evelyn, for taking time out of your day and for all you and your colleagues at ASA and in education, innovation, and ed tech do to make learning better with young people instead of to them. So thank you so much. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Okay. I'm going to hit end.